Chapter 1, The Hermetic Philosophy. From old Egypt have come the fundamental esoteric and occult teachings which have so strongly influenced the philosophies of all races, nations, and peoples. For several thousand years, Egypt, the home of the pyramids and the Sphinx, was the birthplace of the hidden wisdom and mystic teachings. From her secret doctrine, all nations have borrowed India, Persia, Chaldea, Medea, China, Japan, Assyria, ancient Greece, and Rome and other ancient countries partook liberally at the Feast of Knowledge, which the Hierophants and the masters of the land of Isis so freely provided for those who came prepared to partake of the great store of mystic and occult lore which the masterminds of that ancient land had gathered together. In ancient Egypt dwelt the great adepts and masters who have never been surpassed and who have seldom been equal. During the centuries that have taken their processional flight, since the the days of, of great, the great Hermes, in Egypt was located the great lodge of lodges of the mystics. At the door of her temples entered the neophytes, who afterwards as hierophants, adepts, and masters, traveled to the four corners of the earth, carrying with them precious knowledge, which they were ready, anxious, and willing to pass on to those who were ready to receive the same. All students of the occult recognize the debt that they owe to these venerable masters of that ancient land. But among these great masters of ancient Egypt, there once dwelt one of whom masters hailed as the master of masters. <coughs> if this man, or man indeed he was, dwelt in Egypt in the earliest days, he was known as Hermes Trismegistus. He was the father of the occult wisdom the founder of astrology, the discoverer of alchemy. The details of his life story are lost to history, owing to the lapse of the years, though several of the ancient countries disputed with each other in their claims to the honor of having furnished his birthplace and this, and this thousands of years ago. The date of his sojourn in Egypt in that last, his last incarnation on this planet is not known. But it has been fixed at the early days of the oldest dynasties of Egypt. Long before the days of Moses, the best authorities regard him as a contemporary of Abraham. Yeah, Toth. And some of the Jewish traditions go, far, <coughs> go as far as to claim that Abraham acquired a portion of his mystic knowledge from Hermes himself. As the years rolled by after his passing from this plane of life, uh, tradition recording that he lived 300 years in the flesh, the Egyptians defied Hermes and made him one of their gods under the name of Toth. Years after, the people of ancient Greece, who made him one of their many gods, calling him Hermes, the god of wisdom, the Egyptians revered his memory for many centuries, yes, tens of centuries, calling him the scribe of the gods and bestowing upon him distinctively the ancient title Trismegistus, which means the thrice great, the great great, the greatest great, the thrice born, etc. In all the ancient lands, the name of Hermes Trismegistus was revered, the name being synonymous with the fount of wisdom. Even to this day, we use the term hermetic in the sense of secret, sealed so that nothing can escape, etc. And this, by reason of fact, of the fact that the followers of Hermes always observed the principle of secrecy in their teachings, they did not believe in casting pearls before swine, but rather held to the teaching milk for babes, meaning strong men, meat for strong men, both of which uh, maxims are familiar to readers of the Christian scriptures, both of which have been used by the Egyptians for centuries before the Christian era. And this policy of careful dissemination of the truth has always characterized the Hermetics, even into the present day. The Hermetic teachings are to be found in all lands, among all religions, but never identified with any particular country, nor with any particular religious sect. This because of the warning of the ancient teachers against allowing the secret doctrine to become crystallized into a creed, the wisdom of this caution is apparent to all students of history. 
The ancient occultism of India and Persia degenerated and was largely lost owing to the fact that the teachers became priests and so mixed theology with the philosophy that the result being that the occultism of India and Persia has been gradually lost amidst the mass of religious superstition, cults, creeds, and gods. So it was with ancient Greece and Rome. So it was with the hermetic teachings of the Gnostics and early Christians, which were lost at the time of Constantine, whose iron hand smothered philosophy with a blanket of theology, losing to the Christian church that which was its very essence and spirit, and causing it to grope throughout several centuries before it found its way back to its ancient faith. The indications apparent to all careful observers in this 20th century being that the church is now struggling to get back its ancient mystic teachings. But there were always a few faithful souls who kept alive the flame, tending it carefully, and not allowing its light to become extinguished. And thanks to these staunch hearts and fearless minds, we have the truth still with us. But it is not found in books to any great extent. It has been passed along from master to student, from initiate to hierophant, from lip to ear. When it was written down at all, its meaning was veiled in terms of alchemy and astrology so that only those possessing the key could read it aright. This was made necessary in order to avoid the persecutions of the theologians from the Middle Ages who fought the secret doctrine with fire and sword, stake, giblet, and cross. Even to this day, there will be found but few reliable books on the Hermetic philosophy, although there are countless references to it in many books written on various phases of occultism, And yet, the Hermetic philosophy is the only master key which will open all of the doors of the occult's teachings. In the early days, there was a compilation of certain basic Hermetic doctrines passed on from teacher to student, which was known as the Kabbalion. The exact significance and meaning of the term have been lost for several centuries. This teaching, however, is known to many to whom it has descended from mouth to ear on and on throughout the centuries. Its precepts have never been written down or printed, so far as, uh, so far as we know. It was merely a collection of maxims, axioms, and precepts which were non-understandable to outsiders, but which were readily understood by students after the axioms, maxims, and precepts had been explained and exemplified by the Hermetic initiates to their neophytes. These teachings really constituted the basic principles of the art of Hermetic alchemy which, contrary to the general belief, dealt in the mastery of mental forces rather than material elements or the transmutation of one kind of mental vibration into other instead of the changing of one kind of metal into another. So it was dealing with yeah, mental vibrations. The legends of the Philosopher's Stone, which would turn base metal into gold, was an allegory relating to hermetic philosophy, readily understood by all students of true hermeticism. In this little book, of which this is the first lesson, we invite our students to examine into the Hermetic teachings as set forth in the Kabbalion, and as explained by ourselves, humble students of the teachings, who, while bearing the title of initiates, are still students at the feet of Hermes, the Master. We herein give you many of the maxims, axioms, and precepts of the Kabbalion, accompanied by explanations and illustrations which we deem likely to render the teachings more easily comprehended by the modern student, particularly as the original text is purposely veiled in obscure terms. The original maxims, axioms, and precepts of the Kabbalion are printed herein in italics, with the proper credit being given. Our own work is printed in a regular way, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Great. And went from we're from reading somebody going in giving us information. So that according to the teachings, the passage of this book to those ready for the instruction will attract the attention of such as are prepared to receive the teaching. And like, likewise, when the pupil is ready to receive the truth, then this little book will come to him or her. Such is the law, the hermetic principle of cause and effect. And its aspect of the law of attraction will bring lips and ear together, pupil and book in company. So mote it be. All right, so uh, that's the chapter one of the Kabbalion there. 
Uh, end of ch- end of uh, page seven. So we'll pick up on uh, chapter two, page eight next time. It's her- the seven hermetic principles. Uh, but this is good. This is I mean, we talked about this a, a couple of years ago doing this on the show. But I'm I'm glad we're able to start doing this now. It's pretty fun. You know, uh, I know a lot of you out there like me are not 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 big joiners. You know, uh, you don't have to join a secret. I got news for you. You don't have to jo- join a secret society to learn this stuff. You just have to want the information. You want to have to seek it. Uh, you know, you have to seek it out and try to find it and do your best to understand it. So, you know, let's have our own little personal mystery school religion uh, induction here. You know, let's let's read this on the air and go through this ourselves and see what we think about it. We don't have to join somebody's group or, you know, go be a member and wear their ring and, you know use the Masonic nut rag of Jobulon or anything like that. I mean, it's pretty exciting stuff. Chapter two here for you tonight, the seven hermetic principles. The principles of truth are seven. He who knows these understandingly possesses the magic key before whose touch all the doors of the temple fly open. The seven hermetic principles upon which the entire hermetic philosophy is based are as follows. Number one, the principle of mentalism. Number two, the principle of correspondence. Number three, the principle of vibration. Number four, the principle of polarity. Number five, the principle of rhythm. Number six, the principle of cause and effect. Number seven, the principle of gender. These seven principles will be discussed and explained as we proceed with these lessons. A short explanation of each, however, may as well be given at this point. Number one, the principle of mentalism. The all is mind, the universe is mental. The principle embodies the truth that all, this principle embodies the truth that all is mind. It explains the all, which is the substantial reality underlining all the outward manifestations of appearances, which we know under the terms of the material universe, the phenomenon of life, matter, energy, and in short, all that is apparent to our material senses, is spirit, which in itself is unknowable and undefinable, but which may be considered and thought of as a universal, infinite, living mind. It also explains that all the phenomenal world or universe is simply a mental creation of the all, subject to the laws of created things, and that the universe as a whole and in its parts or units has its existence in the mind of the all, in which mind we live and move and have our being. This principle, by establishing the mental nature of the universe, easily explains all of the varied mental and psychic phenomena that occupy such a large portion of the public attention and which, without such explanation, are non-understandable and defy scientific treatment. An understanding of this great hermetic principle of mentalism enables the individual to readily grasp the laws of the mental universe and to apply the same to his well-being and advancement. The hermetic student is enabled to apply intelligently the great mental laws instead of using them in a haphazard manner. With the master key in his possession, the student may unlock many doors of the mental and psychic temple of knowledge and enter the same freely and intelligently. This principle explains the true nature of energy, power, and matter, and why and how all these are subordinate to the mastery of mind. One of the old hermetic masters wrote long ages ago, He who grasps the truth of the mental nature of the universe is well advanced on the path to mastery. And these words are as true today as at the time they were first written. Without this master key, mastery is impossible, and the student knocks in vain at the many doors of the temple. Number two, the principle of correspondence. This principle embodies the truth that there is always a correspondence between the laws and phenomenon of the various planes of being in life. The old hermetic axiom ran 
in these words, as above, so below, as below, so above. And the grasping of this principle gives one the means of solving many a dark paradox and hidden secret of nature. And indeed say that's true. That's uh that's one to me that, that that's one of the secret ways of finding out that that's the whole thing. You can find out what's going on. It's like if you see something going on in a small scale, then that means it's somewhere, you know, there's a good chance it's going on a large scale somewhere else. And that's where it makes you go, oh, wow. Huh. There are planes beyond our knowing. But when we apply the principle of correspondence to them, we are able to understand much that would otherwise be unknowable to us. This principle is of universal application and manifestation on the various planes of the material, mental, and spiritual universe. It is a universal law. The ancient Hermeticists considered the principle this principle as one of the most important mental instruments by which man was able to pry aside the obstacles which hid from view the unknown. Its use even tore aside the veil of Isis to the extent that a glimpse of the face of the goddess might be caught. Just as a knowledge of the principles of geometry enables man to measure distant suns and their movements while seated in his observatory, so a knowledge of the principle of correspondence enables man to reason intelligently from the known to the unknown. Studying the monad, he understands the archangel. Number three, the principle of vibration. This principle embodies the truth that everything is in motion. <coughs> everything vibrates. Nothing is at rest. Facts which modern science endorses and which each new scientific discovery tends to verify, and yet this hermetic principle was enunciated thousands of years ago by the masters of ancient Egypt. This principle explains that the differences between different manifestations of matter, energy, mind, and even spirit result largely from varying rates of vibration, from the all which is pure spirit, down to the grossest form of matter. All is in vibration. The higher the vibration, the higher the position in the scale. The vibration of spirit is at such an infinite rate of intensity and rapidity that it is practically at rest. Just as the rapidly moving wheel seems to be motionless. And at the other end of the scale, there are gross forms of matter whose vibrations are so low as to seem at rest. Between these poles, there are millions upon millions of varying degrees of vibration. From corpuscle to electron, atom and molecule, to worlds and universes. Everything is in vibratory motion. This is also true on the planes of energy and force, which are but varying degrees of vibration. And also on the mental planes, whose states depend upon vibrations. That's where the term vibes comes from. Oh, I don't know, man. I got a bad vibe about that. Vibe is vibration. When you get a vibe from something... You're feeling the vibration of that, whether it be negative or positive. That's, that's a real term. That's where it comes from. And even on to the spiritual planes. An understanding of this principle with the appropriate formulas enables hermetic students to control their own mental vibrations as well as those of others. The masters who apply this principle to conquering of natural phenomena in various ways. He who understands the principle of vibration has grasped the scepter of power, says one of the old writers. Number four, the principle of polarity. This principle embodies the truth that everything is dual. Everything has two poles. Everything has its pair of opposites, all of which were old hermetic axioms. It explains the old paradoxes that have perplexed so many, which have been stated as follows. Thesis in antithesis. Uh, antithes <coughs> thesis and antithesis, are identical in nature, but different in degree. Opposites are the same, differing only in degree. The pairs of opposites may be reconciled. Extremes meet. Everything is and isn't at the same time. All truths are but half-truths. Every truth is a half, a half false. There are two sides to everything, etc., etc. It explains that in everything there are two poles or opposite aspects and that opposites are really only the two extremes of the same thing, 
with many varying degrees between them. To illustrate heat and cold, although opposites are really the same thing, the difference is consisting merely of degrees of the same thing. Look at your thermometer and see if you can discover where heat terminates and cold begins. There is simply no such thing as absolute heat or absolute cold. The two terms, heat and cold, simply indicate varying degrees of the same thing. And that same thing, which manifests as heat and cold, is merely a form of variety and a rate of vibration. So heat and cold are simply the two poles of that which we call heat. And the phenomenon attendant thereupon are manifestations of the principle of polarity. The same principle manifests in the case of light and darkness, which are the same thing, the difference consisting of varying degrees between the two poles of the phenomenon. Where does darkness leave off and light begin? What is the difference between large and small, between hard and soft, between black and white, between sharp and dull? Noise and quiet, high and low, positive, negative. The principle of polarity explains these paradoxes, and no other principle can supersede it. The same principle operates on the mental plane. Let us take a radical and extreme example of love and hate. Two mental states apparently totally different, and yet there are degrees of hate and degrees of love in a middle point in which we use terms like like or dislike which shade into each other so gradually that sometimes we are at a loss to know whether we, li we like or dislike or neither. And all are simply degrees of the same thing. As you will see, if you will think but, but, but a moment, and more than this, and considered... Oh, that doesn't make any sense. And all are simply degrees of the same thing, as you will see, if you will but think a moment. And more than this, and considered of more importance by the Hermeticists, it is possible to change the vibrations of hate to the vibrations of love in one's own mind and in the minds of others. Many of you who read these lines have had personal experiences of the involuntary rapid transition from love to hate and the reverse in your own case and that of others. And you will therefore realize the possibility of this being accomplished by the use of the will, by the means of the hermetic formulas. Good and evil, but are the poles but the same thing. And the hermeticist understands the art of transmuting good into evil by means of an application of the principle of polarity. In short, the art of polarization becomes a phase of mental alchemy known and practiced by the ancient and modern hermetic masters. An understanding of the principle will enable one to change his own polarity as well as that of others if he will devote the time and study necessary to master the art. Number five, the principle of rhythm. This principle embodies the truth that in everything there is manifested a measured motion, to and fro, a flow and inflow, a swing backward and forward, a pendulum-like movement a tide-like ebb and flow, a high tide and low tide between the two poles which exist in accordance with the principle of polarity described a moment ago, there is always an action and a reaction, an advance and a retreat, a rising and a sinking. This is in the affairs of the universe, suns, worlds, men, animals, mind, energy, and matter. This law is manifest in the creation and destruction of worlds, in the rise and fall of nations, in the life of all things, and finally, in the mental states of man. And it is with this latter that the Hermeticists find the understanding of the principle most important. The Hermeticists have grasped this principle, finding its universal application, and have also discovered certain means to overcome its effects in themselves by the use of the appropriate formulas and methods. They apply the mental law of neutralization. They cannot annul the principle or cause it to cease its operation, but they have learned how to escape its effects upon themselves to a certain degree, but depending upon the mastery of the principle. They have learned how to use it instead of being used by it. In this and similar methods consist the art of hermeticists. The master of hermetics polarizes himself at the point at which he desires to rest and then neutralizes the rhythmic swing of the pendulum, which would tend to carry him to the other pole. 
All individuals who have attained any degree of self-mastery do this to a certain degree, more or less unconsciously. But the master does this consciously and by the use of his will and attains a degree of poise and mental firmness, firmness almost impossible of belief on the part of the masses who are swung backward and forward like a pendulum. Uh, I've read the seven aphorisms of summon on the show before. This sounds like the same exact thing. I don't know if anybody can verify this for me, but I, I, I read something on the show. I read a few times a few years ago, the seven aphorisms of summon. And I swear this is the same goddamn thing. I mean, I'll keep reading it, but I, I feel like I've read this before. This is the same, because I talked about this, the pendulum swing, all this stuff. I don't know if you guys that have been out there listening for a while, but yeah. Uh, principle of gender. Yeah, see, I've gone all through this before. Uh, so I'm not going to read any of the rest of that. I've gone through the seven aphorisms of some of them before. That's what those are. Uh, and there's just like one or two left, but there's the next chapter. We'll, we'll stop there. We'll pick up on chapter three next time. Mental transmutation. But yeah, I, I was thinking when I was reading that, some of this stuff sounded real, real familiar to me. Uh, my sister Jamie the other day said that she thought she read that book when she went to the bookstore. She may have actually remembered me reading it, probably why it sounded familiar. But uh, yeah, I just, I read this because somebody asked me to read it. But I, I do feel that like I've gone through some of this stuff already with, it, with I didn't, I, I don't know. I, I didn't know the seven aphorisms of someone came from the Kabbalion, but apparently I guess it does. Because uh, I'd read that stuff on the show a few years ago because there was a story about this guy in Utah that wanted to have those seven aphorisms put on a uh, tablet next to the Ten Commandments in uh, in this park in Utah, and the Mormons got all butthurt and wouldn't let, him, wouldn't let him do it. Chapter 3 of the Kabbalion. Mental Transmutation. As we have stated, the Hermeticists were the original alchemists, astrologers, and psychologists. Hermes, having been the founder of these schools of thought, from astrology has grown modern astronomy. From alchemy has grown modern chemistry. From the mystic psychology has grown, form, grown the modern psychology of the schools, but it must not be supposed that the ancients were ignorant of that which the modern schools supposed to be their exclusive and special property. The records engraved on the stones of ancient Egypt show conclusively that the ancients had a full comprehensive knowledge of astronomy. The very building of the pyramid showing the connection between their design and the study of astronomical science. Nor were they ignorant of chemistry. For the fragments of the ancient writings show that they were acquainted with the chemical properties of things. In fact, the ancient theories regarding physics are being slowly verified by the latest discoveries of modern science notably those relating to the constitution of matter. Nor must it be supposed that they were ignorant of all the so-called modern discoveries in psychology. On the contrary, the Egyptians were especially skilled in the science of psychology, particularly in the branches that the modern schools ignore, but which nevertheless are being uncovered in the name of psychic science, which is perplexing the psychologists of today, and making them reluctantly admit that there may be something in it after all. The truth is that beneath the material chemistry, astronomy, and psychology, that is, the psychology in its phase of the brain action, the ancients possessed a knowledge of transcendental astronomy called astrology, of transcendental chemistry called alchemy, of transcendental psychology called mystic psychology. They possessed the inner knowledge as well as the outer knowledge, the latter alone being possessed by modern scientists. Among the many secret branches of knowledge possessed by the Hermeticists was that transmutation, which known as mental forms the subject matter of this lesson. Transmutation is a term usually employed to designate the ancient art of transmutation of metals, particularly of the base metals into gold. The word transmute means to change from one nature form or substance into another. And accordingly, mental transmutation means the art of changing and transforming mental states, forms, and conditions into others. So you may see that mental transmutation is the art of mental chemistry. If you like the term, a form of practical mystic psychology. 
but this, this means far more than appears on the surface. Transmutation, alchemy, or chemistry on the mental plane is important enough in its effects to be sure, and if the art stopped, there would still be one of the most important branches of study known to man, but this is only the beginning. Let us see why. The first of the seven hermetic principles is the principle of mentalism, the axiom of which is the all is mind, the universe is mental, which means that the underlying reality of the universe is mind. And the universe itself is mental, that is, existing in the mind of the all. We shall consider this principle in succeeding lessons. But let us see the effect of the principle if it be assumed to be true. If the, universe, if the universal is mental, I think it's supposed to be universe. If the universe is mental in its nature, then mental transmutation must be the art of changing the conditions of the universe along the lines of matter, force, and mind. So you see, therefore, that mental transmutation is really like the magic of which the ancient writers had so much to say in their mystical works and about which they gave so few practical instructions. If all be mental, then the art which enables one to transmit mental, transmute rather, mental conditions must render the master the controller of material conditions as well as those ordinarily called mental. As a matter of fact, none but advanced mental alchemists have been able to attain the degree of power necessary to control the grosser physical conditions, such as the control of the elements of nature, the production or cessation of tempests, the production and cessation of earthquakes and other great physical phenomena. But that such men have existed and do exist today as a matter of earnest belief to all advanced occultists of all schools. That the masters exist and have these powers, the best teachers assure their students, having had experiences which justify them in such belief and statements. These masters do not make public exhibitions of their powers, but seek seclusion from the crowds of men in order to better work, there may be, in order to better work, there may it's just so much bad grammar in some of these books. In order to better work, there may along the path of attainment, whatever that means. We mention their existence at this point merely to call your attention to the fact that their power is entirely mental and operates along the lines of the higher mental transmutation of the hermetic principle of mentalism. But students in hermeticists of lesser degree than masters the initiates and teachers are able to freely work along the mental plane in mental transmutation. In fact, all that we call psychic phenomena, mental influence, mental science, and new thought phenomena, etc., operates along the same general lines, for there is but one principle involved. No matter by what name the phenomenon be called. The student and practitioner of mental transmutation works among the mental plane. Transmuting mental conditions, states, etc., into others according to various formulas. The various treatments, affirmations, denials, etc., of the schools of mental science are but formulas, often quite imperfect and unscientific of the hermetic art. The majority of modern practitioners are quite ignorant compared to the ancient masters, for they lack the fundamental knowledge upon which the work is based. Not only may the mental states of oneself be changed or transmuted by hermetic methods, but also the states of others may be and are constantly transmuted in the same way, usually unconsciously, but often consciously by some understanding the laws and principles in cases where the people affected are not informed of the principles of self-protection. And more than this, as many students and practitioners of modern mental science know, Every material condition, depending upon the minds of other people, may be changed or transmuted in accordance with the earnest desire, will, and treatments of person desiring change conditions of life. The public are so generally informed regarding these things at present that we do not deem it necessary to mention the same at length, our purpose at this point being merely to show the hermetic principle and art underlying all of these various forms of practice, good and evil for the force can be used in opposite directions according to the hermetic principles of polarity. 
in this little book, we shall state the basic principles of mental transmutation. That all who read may grasp the underlying principles and thus possess the master key that will unlock the many doors of the principle of polarity. We shall now proceed to a consideration of the first of the Hermetic Seven Principles, the principle of mentalism, in which is explained the truth that the all is mind, the universe is mental. In the words of the Kabbalion, we ask, the close attention and careful study of this great principle on the part of our students, for it is really the basic principle of the whole hermetic philosophy and of the hermetic art of mental transmutation. All right, so that's chapter three of the Kabbalion. We'll pick up on chapter four next time, which is probably titled after the last chapter there, The All. So we'll get into this. This is this this is pretty rad. This uh, this is like you know initiate mystery religion school shit right here. Um, I think it's important to go through this stuff and read this stuff uh, because you know up until now the only people who have access really for the most part to this type of information have been people who have been in the power structure and people who are using this type of knowledge for their own good. We we, we up until this point we have not had people alive who know about the evil rulers and controllers of the world and and the things they've done, the crimes that they've committed against humanity. And so we haven't had people that, that know the, the spiritual aspects of this. And that things like, you know, we're, we're so programmed to think magic and all this stuff is fake and false. But, you know, that, that that's the work of the magi convincing you that all of that stuff is fake and false. TheGlobalReality.com is my website. I'd like to thank everybody for out there for uh, tuning in and being with us tonight. As you always are, 